Many of you may be familiar with today's speaker, Wolfgang Petrich is after all a very well-known public intellectual in Austria. He also has a long career in international uh, diplomacy. He was the EU special envoy for Kosovo. He later served as the EU chief negotiator at the Kosovo peace talks in Rambouillet and in Paris in 1999 and he was later selected as high representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina 1999 till 2002. He later also served as the Austrian ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva and to the OECD in Paris. And he currently serves as the president of the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation. We're very honored to have Wolfgang Petrich with us here today. Welcome uh, Wolfgang. Thank you very much, uh, Jeroen, for your kind words. Uh, it's a strange uh, situation, of course, not the first one, but uh, to be in touch now with uh, the United States and Canada, uh, to see the names of quite a few friends, also like Pinter Bischoff. Uh, uh, it is uh, a truly, it is a truly, truly strange and uh, situation, but. I'm sure we will manage. Now, um, as Jeroen has already pointed out, I'd like to talk about identity politics uh, and armed civil conflict and take the fall of Yugoslavia, more so actually uh, the, the situation in Bosnia Herzegovina, because this was the center of the uh, whole conflict. Now, in these days of a deglobalizing world, everybody is talking about identity, it seems. The recent decision by the Democratic presidential candidate, Joe Biden, to choose Kamala Harris as his vice presidential running mate was quickly framed as being informed by the concept of identity, the emphatic or maybe opportunistic, who knows, recognition of diversity. Indeed, in the conservative commentariat, it was immediately criticized as tokenistic. Whatever the motive, it also illustrates the cultural sea change that has taken place in the global West over the past 30 years. Now, cultural religious markers are about to overtake liberal democratic criteria of qualification and competence in the realm of politics. And it was Francis Fukuyama who already in 2014 published his book about the alleged demand for dignity by the invisible and passionately wrote about the politics of resentment. Consequently, identity was the title of his book. For our topic, dear friends, the thesis of Fukuyama's book is important because, because it unwittingly demonstrates the fundamental difference between the American concept of identity and nation and the one prevalent in Southeastern Europe in the Balkans, if you may. It is the eminent French historian, historian Pierre Norin who provides us with a simple yet helpful distinction when we speak about identity. In the context of issues of heritage, memory, and identity, crucially relevant for comprehending the fall of Yugoslavia, Monsieur Norin writes about the shift of identity from the individual to the collective. They echo and complement one another, he states. Now, heritage traditionally refers to individual property. Yet these days, it characterizes group possession, which in turn helps define the identity of that group. Memory, on the other hand, has moved from the individual to the collective meaning. In a way, it has even replaced the meaning of history. The traditional, or should I say modern, meaning of identity has expressed the unique character of a person in an administrative sense, like uh, 
when you talk about ID cards. Today, however, it is undoubtedly the broadest of the three terms. Just think of national identity. It is in this broader context of meaning that I would like to place my interpretation of the conflict a quarter of a century after the US-led negotiations in Dayton, Ohio, that ended the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now, clearly, my very personal take on the origins of the war and how it was brought to an end is very much influenced and informed by my own experience as the international community's top civil administrator, the high representative in Bosnia-Herzegovina in the immediate post-war years at the turn of the century. Now, three decades ago, the violent dissolution of Yugoslavia took Western policymakers by surprise. Interpretations of its causes ranged from economic explanations, the decline of the Yugoslav economy since the 1970s uh, oil shocks with rising foreign debt shortages, wage freezes, accelerating into continuous crisis in the 1980s. Remember, uh, Tito died in May 1980. Now, and this was accompanied by IMF loans and conditionalities, severe austerity, rampant youth unemployment, and a hyperinflation. And finally, in the early 1990s, unpopular economic reforms, including privatization of socially owned enterprises, currency devaluation, market opening to foreign goods and investments. And importantly, the ever increasing economic disputes amongst the Yugoslav republics that illustrate, uh, which are illustrated by the select introduction of customs duties within this uh, Yugoslavia. Now, the social economic developments were compounded by, and now I come to the second cause, shifting geopolitics at the end of the Cold War. At the height of the Cold War, Yugoslavia's non-aligned status ensured access to relatively benevolent terms for loans and trade with the West, which wanted to keep Tito's Yugoslavia out of the USSR sphere of influence and good uh, trading terms and large scale contracts for Yugoslavia's engineering firms from other non-aligned countries in Africa and Asia in particular helped uh, uh, the Yugoslav economy. Now all these geopolitical considerations receded in the late 1980s, the SFRY lost many economic benefits feeding into the drastic decline. 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991 rendered non-aligned Yugoslavia geopolitically irrelevant for the winning West. These all are relevant and important, even crucial factors contributing to the dissolution of Yugoslavia. These could have been fixed, however, as many a transition country in Eastern and Southeastern Europe has demonstrated. However, in the case of Yugoslavia, and I'm now coming to the alleged third root cause for the dissolution, and there are what we call primordialist theses around. And these theses, claim that the conflict was the inevitable result of perennial irreconcilable hostility existing between ethnic groups in a heterogeneous society. Thus the wars were caused by ancient hatreds based on ethnic identity. A prime example of uh, uh, such a thesis is Robert Kaplan's Balkans Ghosts. Now, this reasoning is rooted in cultural determina uh, determination and racial and ethnic essentialism, asserting that uh, ethnic identity is 
fixed, innate, and intransient with distinct social boundaries pointing towards the ancient schisms between Croat Roman Catholicism and Serbian Greek Orthodoxy, the legacy of the Ottoman Muslim occupation, and more recently, the genocidal actions of the Croatian Ustasha. This view clearly implies that Tito's comparatively prosperous and stable multi-ethnic, multilingual Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia might never had a chance to become a viable state. Academic and political dissent about the origins of the conflict and its subsequent peace processes prevail to this very day. A synthesis of the explanations mentioned above seems to provide the most useful understanding in my opinion. Economic and geopolitical reasons provide an analysis of the necessary conditions in which the Yugoslav conflict occurred, but ne neither explain the primary causes. An identity-based approach can provide insight into the extreme genocidal violence of the war. However, instead of a primordialist conception of identity, a constructivist approach provides much more nuanced and useful insights. It sees identity not as fixed and innate, but socially constructed and performatively enacted. This leaves room for the agency of individual actors, such as political leaders, and their role in fanning the flames of antipathy and violence. Now, this interpretation would have provided Western peacemakers, and this is my main point, with a greater awareness and comprehension of the fundamentally differing concepts of Western and Central European perceptions of state, nation, and identity. Now, as I will try to explain, identity politics Balkan style continues to hamper democratic and economic progress in the successor states, despite the unprecedented foreign interventions and continued European assistance. Now, moving on, I will attempt to map out the armed conflict and the subsequent peace efforts with a focus on Bosnia and the Dayton Accords. Now, in the context of ethno-national exclusivism and the race for territory expressed in the ethnic cleansing and the mutual and systematic destruction of cultural and religious monuments. In this way, I want to argue that the fall of Yugoslavia and the creation of severe, uh, I'm sorry, of seven successor states was the first identity-based conflict in the post-Cold War world. And that identity, collective or group identity, remains an enduring political tool for the usurpation of power under formally democratic rules. Now, some facts and figures, just to remind that the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina was a civil war intermingled with a war of aggression on the part of Belgrade and to a lesser degree Zagreb uh, that took about 100,000 uh, civilian lives, close to 80% from uh, the majority population of Muslim Bosniaks, more than 50% of the population of about 4 million were refugees and IDPs. 95% of Bosnia's infrastructure, housing, business, and industry were destroyed. The three and a half year war was finally stopped by a US led NATO intervention after the Srebrenica genocide in July of 1995, five with the subsequent ceasefire in October of the same year. Now, the systematic destruction of cultural and religious monument, which hides the true nature of power, is staggering. Again, the main victims were Muslim religious and cultural sites, 
about 1,700 mosques were destroyed. These attest to my thesis that the conflict was about culture and civilization. It was about the eradication of the other. Now the long and winding diplomatic efforts were, were seriously hampered both by European divisions and American hesitation. President Clinton saw ancient hatreds at work. He had read Kaplan's book. Secretary of State James Baker could not see that Americans have a dog in the fight in this faraway Balkans country. In fact, the problem started with the first diplomatic effort already in 1992 to stop the war in Bosnia when Lord Carrington from the UK and the Portuguese diplomat Jose Cutilero proposed a peace plan purely based on ethnic criteria. Now this ethnic logic to resolve the Bosnian conflict very much in line with Belgrade's and Zagreb's ideology of segregation and partition was continued with the Vance Owen cantonalization plan, which immediately upon presentation fueled further ethnic cleansing in central Bosnia. Tragically, this ill-fated Western proposal directly led to the so-called war within the war between Croats and Bosniaks in 1993 and 94. The Washington Agreement of 1994 eventually forced the two warring sides into the so-called Muslim Croat Federation, which in turn was incorporated into the Dayton Agreement of November and December of 1995. From the outset, the international mediators were caught up in the ethno-territorial trap of the three sides. While the transition in Eastern Europe was led by the likes of Václav Havel or Lech Walesa, such political icons could not be found in Yugoslavia. In Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the communist nomenklatura was ousted by democracy movements supported by a strong civil society. This, however, was not the case in Yugoslavia, where dissidents like Vojislav Šešel, who was defended by Western human rights organizations when imprisoned by the Tito regime, was and still is a Serb ultranationalist at heart. His paramilitaries, along with Arkhan's Tigers, did most of the dirty work for Milosevic in Bosnia. The then leaders of Serbia and Croatia, both communists turned nationalists, followed a clear ethno-territorial policy, which led directly into conflict and war. Never was there in Western capitals a thorough analysis of the real situation in Yugoslavia provided. Diplomacy was preoccupied with the post-Cold War events in Eastern Europe and understandably so. Now when political propaganda in Yugoslavia started to identify the Slovenes, the Croats, the Serbs, and Yugoslavs were considered national traitors, alarm bells should have rung in Brussels, Bonn, and Washington, D.C. Now, as in so many previous cases, it all started in academia and in an increasingly chauvinistic media across Yugoslavia. However, the international community preoccupied with the implosion of the Soviet Union and the reunification of Germany has widely ignored the developments which had already taken up speed in the waning days of Tito to eventually culminate in the early 1990s. It was arguably too late already, I would say retrospectively, when the now infamous memorandum by the Serb Academy of Sciences was leaked in 1986, which in turn Milosevic adopted as a sort of intellectual blueprint for his aggressive ethnic policy in the 1990s. Now, while Eastern Europe eagerly embraced liberal uh, democracy and its capitalist economic model, 
the leaders of the splintering Yugoslav successor states embarked on a populist ethno-nationalist policy in its worst form. It was Pierre Norin's collective identity that the secessionist leaders embraced in its most aggressive and exclusivist form. And it stood in stark contrast to the Western liberal notion of individual identity and citizenship. Now, consequently, Western diplomats were utterly unprepared, worse even ignorant, when they walked into the Yugoslav conundrum. Not having thoroughly analyzed and understood the very complex situation on the ground, past and present, is the original sin of the whole US-European intervention in former Yugoslavia. The historic failing is encompassed in the Dayton Accords, an exercise in futility to provide war-torn Bosnia a feasible government's framework, including a civic constitution. Now, Richard Holbrook, the architect of Dayton, calls his account to end a war, and there he prevailed. But he might as well have called his book to square a circle. When the international effort in state building took up speed in Bosnia, it soon became obvious that the peace treaty is no blueprint for a viable European state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now today, only a few weeks away from its 25th anniversary, Dayton Bosnia is still unfinished business, divided into two practically autonomous entities, 10 cantons, and a weak and paralyzed state government with three ethnically elected presidents. Now, in order not to sound too pessimistic, let me stress that there are, of course, also positive developments, not least the fact that Bosnia has not returned to war. A cold peace prevails to this very day. Now, back to my analysis. The main reason for the start state building, as I see it, lies in the unsuccessful, if not impossible, integration of collective rights and an inordinately high degree of autonomy as laid out in the Dayton Constitution. This constitution, through its provisions protecting the constituent groups as collectives, cements the country's ethnopolitics, while a politics organized around issues and policies and with it, a civic identity never gets a chance to develop. Now, this was naturally not intended and the result, I believe, of an oversight by Western policymakers who simply presupposed certain traits about democracy. I've debated this cardinal point with the American framers of the Dayton Constitutions many times, and I have soon understood that the main misperception lies in the fact that the constitutional so-called vital interest clause was intended by the American lawyers to protect group rights. Now, in reality, it turned out to be the most effective blocking mechanism. Now, what was meant to be a protective safety mechanism to rebuild intercommunal confidence after the conflict was soon abused by shrewd politicians. And these were the same political actors that have led the country into war as a tool to block any meaningful change and render the state dysfunctional. Indeed, Dayton allowed Bosnia's wartime leaders to continue their dismal job post-war. Dayton has turned these politicians into peacetime politicians to build the future Bosnia. Of course, I should add, there were some rare um, exceptions also uh, in uh, the political class and still are in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now, this unhelpful continuity undoubtedly intensified the inherent flaws of the accords, which had 
created an improbable state whose overly complex constitutional arrangements favor collective politics over individual citizen rights. In short, data does not encourage cross-ethnic integration. Ethnic parties still dominate. Clientelism, cronyism persists. Intra and inter-ethnic corruption, on the other hand, is pervasive. Now, these conditions are undergirded by a populist politics of fear. Now, to come to a close, what can be done, we need to ask. As so often before, my presentation is long on criticism and short on solutions. Why? Because there are no simple solutions. But what is urgently needed is a re-engagement of the European Union. US support would be welcome, but at the moment, it is not the right support around. And this re-engagement, I should add, would be in the very best self-interest of the Union, of the European Union itself. Developments in Bosnia and Herzegovina but also in, in many other success, successor states, in most actually, point into a dangerous direction for Europe. External actors, old and new, like Russia, China, Turkey, are exporting to the whole region authoritarian, if not autocratic models of government, which of course are not unknown to the Balkans politicians. Brussels is on the defensive, since its very own member states, Hungary, Poland, also Bulgaria and Romania have departed from liberal democratic principles and have embraced populist and ethno-nationalist policies. What then would eventual membership of the West Balkan Six mean for the very fabric of the European Union? Would they strengthen the Hungarian way and historic experience points to this direction, I'm afraid. Or would Serbia, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Albania, Bosnia, Kosovo transform into liberal democracies? Viewed from this angle, the Balkans is an eminently European story. In fact, it has always been. However, Europe is not is the only logical, cultural, and political location, home for the region. And the best aspiration that its politicians and citizens can have in the interest of their countries is eventual European Union membership indeed. As we have learned in post-war Europe, apparent ancient hatreds can be overcome in a joint project of integration and the bridging of differences if responsible leadership resists the temptation of ethno-nationalist demagoguery. And if ordinary citizens can feel the benefits of overcoming their differences with neighbors and former foes. We've also seen that in the process of integrating, overcoming and reconciling new identities can take shape. Perhaps one day, a common inclusive identity, national and European, can unite Bosnia and Herzegovina, Muslims, Catholics and Orthodox, Serbs, Bosniaks and Croats as citizens in joint opposition to ethno-nationalist tendencies. Now, not unlike, and this is my last sentence, not unlike the liberal democratic part of the United States now unites around an inclusive concept of American identity with room for races and faith in opposition to a nativist, ethno-nationalist America first. Thank you so much. <laughs>